everybody, it's Taylor, and today I'm starting on a new project, which is a new overdress for my Italian Renaissance gown. So I've talked about this gown before in a previous video because I wore it in Venice for Carnival, and I talked a little bit about it, but I'd like to make a new overdress for this outfit to wear for an upcoming photo shoot, and I want something that's a little bit more autumnal. So I should start out by saying, number one, and most importantly, that I am not an expert in the Italian Renaissance. I really don't know much about costuming before, like maybe say 1740 or so. So this was all an experimental project that I did before. I'm not really aware of any good commercial patterns that are out there for this style of dress. So if you happen to know one that you've used that was successful and easy to use, please feel free to leave a note in the comments in case other people are looking for commercial patterns to use. Unfortunately, I don't have any to recommend. I just kind of made this up. My study on the dresses from this era consisted entirely of looking at some pictures and then just making up what I thought this dress was supposed to look like. So like I said, not an expert. I don't know if any of the stuff that I'm doing is historically accurate, but this is just what worked for me to create a gown that in the end I was super happy with. So I'm going to go over my methods and just tell you what steps I'm going to take to make a new overdress for this outfit, and hopefully it'll help somebody else who's going to make one. In particular, this is a Venetian styled gown that dates to about 1490 to 1500. During this period, even within Italy, each individual city state had sort of specific styles. So this one was focused on Venice and I'm going to make another Venetian gown because it was really easy and I really like the style and it's the thing I've done the most research on. So this is a specifically Venetian style Italian Renaissance gown. So let me tell you a little bit about the dress itself. This actually consists of two dresses. There is an overdress and an underdress, which is the orange that you see here. And the sleeves are part of the underdress. So what I'm gonna be making is a new overdress that's gonna go underneath the other one. So it's really simple. In fact, this is only held on by two hooks and eyes. Really, I just need one, but I liked that it held closed here. So I have two hooks and eyes that hook it on. And otherwise, it's just one big giant open dress, essentially. So I'll be remaking a new overdress, but I'm gonna be making it with this one in mind because it's really pretty. So it basically is closed in the front, but it does lace up via spiral lacing here in the center. And then it has sleeves that tie on to a hoop that's sewn into the sleeve. So this just ties on. So here's where my this is not historically accurate comes in, and that is that I wear my 1790s Regency style stays underneath this dress because it gives sort of that oomph <laughs> that you get. This is a very busty period. So much like you get in the 1790s in the early Regency period, it's a really similar silhouette. So I decided the easiest thing for me to do was just going to be to wear it over these little stays. Some other people that I traveled with in Venice actually stiffened this bodice lining with boning and um, pad stitching so that this sort of became like a bra basically, but I did make mine over these stays and I'll be doing that again this time as well. It's also worn over a very full shift light garment that's called either a kamika or a kamicia. I'm Kamikia, Kamicha. I'm not sure how to actually pronounce the word, um, but it's a really, really fluffy undergarment. And the shift sleeves are super full because they show through under these sleeves and puff out to give this really interesting puffy fullness that's sort of like coming out from underneath the sleeves. You get a lot of extra oomph from this undergarment, which helps give this an extra level of luxuriousness. My underdress is two panels of a silk taffeta that I got from Renaissance Fabrics. Um, and then I used like maybe another yard to do the sleeves and the bodice. So depending on how long your waist measurement is, that'll determine how much fabric you need. But I think that I only used four yards of fabric for this underdress. My overdress is a very different story. I think I used Somewhat, I think I used about eight yards of fabric for that one, which is insane because I used three panels in the skirts and it also had a humongous train on it because I wanted it to be this incredibly lavish, luxurious dress. And it certainly was, but I won't be doing this on my next one. 
For one thing, walking around with a train like that is a real production and it takes a lot of attention, but primarily it's because I'm really limited on the fabric that I have for my new dress that I'm gonna be making. So let's talk about that. So this is my new fabric for my new dress. It's a really cool vintage fabric that I got from a friend who was de-stashing this out of her uh, fabric collection, and I don't know where she got it. I'm pretty sure it's a synthetic, probably a rayon because it's still really soft, but it's just such a cool fabric that even though it's not 100% silk, I couldn't resist using it. And I think it's going to look really beautiful with my underdress as well because it has these sh uh, this shot colors of almost chartreuse, but also lots of orange and everything in there too. One of the problems with this fabric is that it's super narrow. It's only 36 inches wide, and I don't have that much of it. I think I've only got six yards, but six yards of 36 inches doesn't go very far. So I'm going to have to do three panels for the skirt, but it'll have to be as short as I can make it. And I'll probably have to do some piecing on the bodice. I'm really going to be pushing it to get this done <laughs> with six yards, but it's just so beautiful that I can't resist using it for a project like this. So that's what we'll be doing next. So this is my pattern for my overdress. And what I've done here is drawn in the lines of what the pattern for my underdress looks like. So it's basically exactly the same. It's like that I've dropped all of the seam lines for everything except for the very front. This would continue this part would continue straight on and be more of like a scoop neck instead of the V neck that I have on my overdress so that it shows a little bit underneath the closure of the front. And this way, the overdress just covers the narrower straps and the lower back of the underdress. So you only see the overdress for part of it, except for this little part where it sticks out. Hopefully that makes sense. Because I have such a limited amount of fabric, I'm going to start out by measuring and laying out my skirt panels. Once I know how much is needed for the skirts, I'll know what I have left to work with for the bodice. I'm just taking the measurements right off of my underdress and adding a few inches for hems and other incidentals. Knowing that I'll need three panels of fabric for the skirt, I'm marking those on the length of the fabric so I can see exactly what I have left over for the bodice. Oof. All right, so this right here is what I have left to make my bodice. As you can see, it is a very small amount of fabric. And that's really without even adding an inch to each of these for like incidental mistakes and stuff like that. Oof. Boy, this is gonna be a tall order. I'm actually not even sure it's possible. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my pattern pieces and actually lay them out on here and see even if with piecing this is a feasible thing to do. Oof. This is not looking good. <laughs> because the problem is I can't just flip the pieces over because there's a pattern here. So they're all going to have to be facing the same direction. And I just, ooh. Even if I'm piecing these shoulders at the top, I don't know if I have enough. All right, uh, this, is, this is not enough fabric. I mean, I'd literally, if I had like, if I had like three more inches, maybe five more inches, I could do it with just this one piece. But I think even with piecing, there's just not enough left here in tiny scraps to actually do it. I know I can't make this any shorter because then the bottom would show. So I think what I'm going to do, and this is what I really wanted to avoid, is I think I will take a four inch section off of one of these skirt panels and use that to give me additional bodice fabric. This is really annoying because that's actually way more than I need. And it's, it is going to impact the fullness of the skirt, but I just don't see another way around it. And I think, I think that's my only option. That's what I'm going to do. This is the life I chose. I knew this was going to be a tricky amount of fabric to work with. And I was right. <laughs> what I'm going to do first is cut these down to 50 inch panels. And then I'll cut four inches out of one of them. And this actually may be okay because since I'm giving myself some extra fabric, that means I can be more careful about matching these patterns along each seam line so that it looks like one continuous piece of fabric and they're not like, 
off kilter, which will be really annoying and drive me crazy. So, okay, let's cut these skirt panels. This is the point of no return. I really hope I don't screw it up because I have got nothing <laughs> to work with if I make a mistake. So, you know, no pressure or anything. <sighs> Once the skirt pieces are cut, I'm going to fold these up and put them away for later use. We'll do the skirt in part two of the construction of this dress. Okay, let's cut out these bodice pieces. Now that I have some extra fabric to work with, I have the luxury of matching my pattern pieces a little bit better. I'm using the pattern of the first cut to make the second cut so I can line up the motifs as perfectly as possible. This way they mirror each other nicely. This is my leftover piece of what I cut off the skirt. And this is my center back pattern piece, which is unfortunately ooh, just a little bit too long. So what I'm going to do is I've actually split this up into two pieces. And I'm going to piece it with uh, what was left over there. So that means I'm going to have a seam probably right about here, which is like the back of the shoulder. I think that's going to be the least intrusive place that I can put a piecing seam. Uh, you know, having a seam right there won't be visible from the front. It'll be a little bit visible from the back, but I'm going to try really, really hard to match up the pattern perfectly with these two pieces so that hopefully it won't be too intrusive. And of course, once you get trim and stuff like that on it, it's not going to be that obvious at all. But oh boy, I'm really down to the dregs of this fabric. But remember, piecing is period and it's okay. I'm making a lot of effort here to match the pattern so that there won't be an intrusive seam line in the middle of my bodice. I'm sewing this down with a tiny stitch that basically disappears into the pattern of the fabric. The seam definitely isn't invisible, but I think you'll have to be looking really closely to notice it's there. Now that I have the bodice fashion fabric all cut out, I'm going to cut out the lining of the bodice, which is going to be a really beautiful, sturdy white linen that I got from Burnley and Trowbridge. I specifically chose a linen that has a little bit of body and strength to it because the fabric of my silk is so flimsy. So this will just give a more substantial base for me to work on. All I'm going to do is just cut out duplicates of my bodice pieces, and then I'm going to sew up the lining separately and then the fashion fabric separately both of them on my machine and then i will be able to put them together as one piece <laughs> I'm putting the bodice together by ironing under all of the edges of the fashion fabric by half an inch and then laying it on top of the linen lining. Then I'm turning under the linen so that it slightly underhangs the fashion fabric.
So now I'm going to sew this down by doing a spaced back stitch all along the bottom and all along the top just to anchor everything together. All right, this is all sewn down now. I did back stitches all along the bottom and top and front edges. They are basically invisible thanks to this fabric. Around the arms, I did little tiny whip stitches and that's because getting this turned smoothly was really tricky going around this curve because this fabric just wants to fray so badly. So the whip stitch is gonna sort of hold these edges in a little bit better. So now I just need to fit the shoulder straps, which I'll do next. The shoulders are fitted by folding the front piece over the back piece, trimming off any excess, and then sewing them down with a small whip stitch. I also made sure that the edges of the arms and neck matched up, which is why I left the tops of the shoulder straps unsewn. There are a couple of more steps to finishing this bodice, but I'll do those at the very end once I have the skirts attached as well. Thanks for watching part one of the construction of my Italian Renaissance dress. In part two, I'll be making up the skirts, attaching them to the bodice, and then showing you the amazing place where I got to take pictures of this gown. See you soon!